everybody and welcome to tonight's event. Um, for those of you who are joining us for your first Talking Justice, welcome and uh, there's a few familiar faces who are joining us again. My name is Hayley Mansfield and I'm the Executive Officer of Arc Justice. Some of you might know us better by a couple of our programs in Bendigo, which is Housing Justice and the Loddon Campaspe Community Legal Centre. So I'd like to acknowledge tonight that we're meeting on Ja Ja Rung Country and pay my deepest respect to, respect to elders past and present. Whenever I'm doing an acknowledgement, I also like to think about what has brought us together for an event. And tonight, reflecting on press freedom and what that means for my community and our community, our Aboriginal people in Australia. While our community certainly has a mixed uh, relationship with the media, there's no doubt that repeatedly we have seen media expose human rights abuses of Aboriginal people that would likely otherwise go unknown. Tonight is our largest Talking Justice event, um, and what a beautiful venue to be hosting it in as well. Uh, we've been delivering Talking Justice since 2014, and in 2018 we commenced a partnership with uh, the Goldfields Library to deliver the event. Our aim of the evening is to create a platform um, for an in-depth discussion about a range of social justice issues that would have the potential to impact on rights and the well-being of the community. We recognise that in order to, to create change and for, in order to advocate, we need to have information, and not just about our own views, but the views of other people as well. And tonight's uh, event could not be more timely given today's uh, federal court decision, which I'm sure that we will be uh, teasing out. I would also like to say a big thank you to our sponsors who we'll mention later um, tonight, who've helped um, to bring the event. I'd like to thank Annika Keaton, who's worked extremely hard um, to, to get everybody here. And all of our guest speakers tonight who are generously giving their time um, and have traveled for afar to come up um, and here uh, to, to, to deliver on this um, important topic. John has just made me nervous because I, he said, you're not gonna say anything about me, are you? And I'm like, well, I, I thought I might because I had to introduce you. And then he's like, it's okay, I'll correct it if it's wrong. So, <laughs> so um, I'm really pleased to be able to um, welcome John Fain as our MC for the evening, whose skills and background could not be more perfect um, for the t discussion tonight. After seven years as a lawyer, John entered radio broadcasting in 1989 to produce and present Radio National's Law, radio National's law Report. He went on to pre present 3LO's morning and afternoon programs and worked on various ABC programs before moving to the morning program in seven, uh, on 774 ABC Radio in 1997. After a radio career spanning three decades, John retired um, in uh, 2019, in the end of 2019, and we're now in February, early 2020. So um, I imagine it's going to be quite an active retirement. Um, please uh, uh, join me in welcoming and thanking John tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Hayley, and um, I'm always anxious to explain the threat to correct you. People often rely on Wikipedia, and it's full of bullshit. <laughs> and I want to add on to your recognition of the Indigenous people on whose land we meet, my respects for their elders as well, and to express my absolute impatience for a treaty or treaties, or a Makarata, in order to try at least in part to remedy and correct the mistakes of our history. And until we do, as a country, it's my view, we can't move forward. <laughs> and since you interrupted me by applauding, I'll point out I have made that comment countless times in the last two years since I first thought of it as I was speaking as the guest speaker at the Islamic Council of Victoria's annual dinner, I've never once, never once said those words without being interrupted in the same way that you just interrupted me. And it astonishes me, this is in parentheses, it's not why we're here, but it astonishes me that there can be such a gap. I speak to very diverse groups of people, including probus groups, Brighton mothers, sorry, Brighton mothers, on their way back from tennis and so on. And 
it never ceases to amaze me that there can be such a gap between grassroots sentiment and the national leadership, but I'll leave that alone. Does anyone mind if I take my coat off? I'm sure no one does. It's stinking hot. So, we're here to talk about one of the most important aspects, one of the fundamental pillars of any democracy. And democracy is a fragile machine. If you don't do the maintenance on any machine, it breaks. Whether it's a farm pump or a tractor or a car or a motorbike, if you don't maintain a machine, it breaks. And we have been profoundly neglectful of some of the maintenance of some of the machinery of our democracy, and one of those is a free and independent media. Not being harangued by elected politicians, but being protected, it should be, by elected politicians, who are supposed to represent the people, not vested interests. It's hilarious that on this very week that we meet, we've seen the federal police say, oh, you know what? It's kind of a bit shitty when we raid journalists, steal their data, their machinery, their computers, go through their personal effects. Gives us a really bad name, and I'm sure Annika may have something, in fact, quite a lot to say about it, because she's one of those journalists. It's extraordinary that they're trying to spin their way out of something that they're showing no signs of retreating from in the courts. We've got Bernard Caleri and Witness K, if you followed that, about Timor, where Australia inexplicably spies on our neighbour, Timor-Leste, and then tries to cover it up, and then raids the office of the lawyer representing an opponent in the international court and then keeps going, doubling up and doubling up as you do in hardball commercial litigation where the stakes are just money. And you double up in order to try and blast your opponent out of the court. But this isn't about money. This is about morals. It's about values. It's extraordinary times that we live in. And then over in the United States, hilariously, that man Zuckerberg has said, oh, I think maybe Facebook should accept regulation. For years and years he has argued that social media must never be regulated and to do so is to inhibit the wonders of his vehicle for amassing an unimaginable pirate's fortune in record time. And my final remark there is a little historical analogy. As many of you may know, I'm a bit of a car nut. In 1895, Carl Benz combined the fairly new internal combustion engine with a carriage and created the world's first self-propelled motor vehicle. In 1895, the first car was on the road. It took, in most countries, between 10 and 15 years before there were road rules, car licenses to see who could drive them, and such newfangled concepts as motor vehicle insurance, indemnity, and the like. And that gap between the technological innovation which changed society worldwide forever and the regulation that was required to govern it, that took between 10 and 15 years in almost every country. Facebook is just more than 10 years old. We're going through exactly the same thing. New technology, it's changing society, and the regulations, the framework around which it works, is just starting now to be created. And in the meantime, Mark Zuckerberg, without even knowing it, has echoed the exact sentiments of Henry Ford and other automotive pioneers who said at the time that cars were invented, oh no, don't make rules that will inhibit the growth of this fabulous new technology. Word for word, they've argued the same self-serving claptrap to protect their own destiny and their fortunes. We've been suckered by Zuckerberg all over again. 
We have three, I might say, quite brilliant speakers for you this evening. They get to speak, I think they've been told, for between five and ten minutes. Richard's looking as if, oh no, but I prepared a half hour speech. And then it's my job to try and draw some threads. Richard Ackland is in the blue shirt and the dark glasses over there, dark framed glasses. I first met Richard when I was a baby lawyer at Fitzroy Legal Service a million years ago. He was then already an esteemed commentator on media and the law and one of the very first, one of the pioneers of that overlap between the two different professions. He publishes Justinian. He also contributes the best gossip column you could ever read on Saturdays in the Saturday paper under the title of Gadfly. And if you're not already making it the first thing you read on your weekend newspaper hunt, you should, I recommend it. He also worked at the ABC for many years, presenting both Late Night Live and Radio National Breakfast. Annika Smethurst is News Corp's best journalist. <laughs> She's also found herself in that I might say, unenviable position of not just writing the news and analysing the news, but being the news, which creates extraordinary stress. I've seen at the ABC what it's done to two of my former colleagues, and it's tough. The fact that she's kept going and not even once visibly flinched has been, I might say, absolutely stellar. And we are very lucky to have her, and of course she's a local as well, and you can enjoy her as you might have this Sunday morning on ABC TV's excellent Insiders program with the excellent David Spears now in the chair. How good is renewal in the media? <laughs> and our final commentator is Professor Matthew Rickardson. He's Professor of Journalism at Deakin after a long and distinguished career, including writing for many, many years for The Age newspapers and Fairfax. He's also a member of the Press Council and was one of the principal architects of the, what's known as the Finks Inquiry, or Finkelstein, Ray Finkelstein QC, who was commissioned by the former Labor government to advise on reforming press laws in what is still an extraordinary episode in recent Australian political history. So I'm going to invite Annika to speak first, and I hope you don't mind. That's a bit of an ambush. Followed by Matthew and then Richard, and I'm going to ask you to speak for as long as you want, but not more than 10 minutes and then we'll get into it. Thank you very much. I actually didn't prepare any notes because I think these things work better as a conversation, but I'm happy to, I guess, give you a rundown of um, why I'm here. If you lived under a rock for the last year, you might not know. Um, I work in Canberra at the press, in the press gallery. I'm the political editor for the Sunday News, News Corp newspapers. As John said, I am a Bendigo girl. I went to school here and I worked at the Bendigo Weekly uh, before moving to Melbourne and, and working at the Herald Sun. Um, a couple of years ago now, I wrote a story which I really didn't think got that much attention at the time and I was a bit disappointed with given how much uh, effort I'd put into getting this story. It was um, about a proposal uh, that had been discussed at very high levels of the Home Affairs Department uh, to change the laws of one of our spy agencies. Australians don't know a lot about our spy agencies traditionally because they uh, act in the shadows and that's the way they like it. But we have about six spy agencies. Three of them roughly look at foreign threats. Three of them look at local threats such as ASIO. They investigate us. Uh, our cyber spies at the ASD wanted the power to start looking on us and that meant reading our text messages, uh, looking at our bank statements and being able to do so perhaps without a warrant just with the tick off from a minister. Um, I became aware of this. This wasn't a popular decision. In fact, the Prime Minister at the time, Malcolm Turnbull, wasn't even in favour of it, but didn't know that this was being discussed in Home Affairs, and we wrote that story. And it was pretty hard to follow. I wrote it on a Sunday, and Monday came around, and there was a little bit in the paper, but everybody just moved on. And um, I was kind of upset about that, but moved on too. Uh, until June 4 last year, when seven police showed up at my house uh, and decided they wanted to raid my property to find information about the story. And since then, they haven't ruled out me being prosecuted and going to jail. 
and we have gone to the High Court to challenge the validity of that warrant, which will be discussed because of the ABC decision today, and we're still waiting. We think it'll maybe be another four to six weeks before we get a result, um, and that investigation can move on. But as John said, it, it creates a huge amount of stress. Uh, I don't care really in many ways because I don't think it deters journalists and it hasn't stopped me wanting to write stories. Um, but I think it has a really chilling effect on whistleblowers and potentially more people coming through who see wrongdoing and deciding now not to come forward, which is a real challenge and is a real challenge for journalism. So I, I think journalists are quite a bolshy bunch and I don't know too many that have been... Um, too scared by what's happened in a sense that they wouldn't write a good story if it came across their desk. But those stories are less likely to come across their desk uh, if this is the path we go down, and I think that's really damaging. So hopefully we can talk a bit more about that tonight. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to this event. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here, very honoured. Um, and as John has already mentioned, uh, Richard Ackland is the kind of doyen in the media field of journalists who deal with stuff to do with the media and the law. And so I'm going to leave that particular aspect of, um, of, the, of the issue to, to him. In the, in the opening, brief opening remarks I wanted to make, I wanted to... Uh, well, I want to ask, start by posing a question, which is the combined Australian mainstream media has for about six or seven months now been campaigning vigorously uh, through its own organs to persuade the government, the federal government, to change the laws to do with the media. The question is how successful do you think they have been so far? I just ask you to hold that thought because I'm not going to answer just yet. I'll let you think about that because now I want to take you back in time about uh, nine years or so to another event that John alluded to, which was the inquiry into the media and media regulation that um, the former Labor government set up under Julia Gillard, Ray Finkelstein, retired federal court judge, uh, a QC was... was um, as is the way of these things, asked to head up the inquiry, and I was the sort of media person to provide him with advice. Um, and I don't know if any of you know Ray Finkelstein, but the first thing he said to me was, I know nothing at all about the media. And then, as, then said, you're the guy, you're the expert, you tell me everything, and I'm not quite sure of my strike, strike rate in terms of the advice that I gave him that he accepted, but I think it was um, relatively low. So. <laughs> He, he very much has his own mind. He worked extremely hard to get across the whole, all of the nuances of the media industry and its issues and regulation and read back in the history of press freedom, all of the kind of sources way, way back into ancient Greece and ancient Rome and so on. Uh, so I'm not going to go through that whole, that whole contest again because um, we'd be here for another 10 minutes. But suffice to say, the report or the inquiry looked into the way in which the press council was operating and the way in which media regulation and accountability in this country was working. In short, concluded it wasn't working very well at all and made some recommendations to improve that. Okay? Um, the news media as an industry overwhelmingly re uh, rejected the, uh, the, the recommendations of the report, which is their right. Um, the problem was that they never really reported in any great detail what was actually in the report. So unless you've read the report, and it's 468 pages long, and there's only two jokes in it, and I know because I put them both in, um, you won't know what's in that thing. Um, so this kind of weird debate occurred whereby no one really knew what we were debating about, and Ray Finkelstein and I were compared to Joseph Stalin and others of his ilk in terms of what we were going to do to freedom of the press in this country. And in 2013, there was a kind of half-hearted and cack-handed attempt to actually make some law out of 
that our report and another one that was being done at the same time, the Convergence Review, and it all fell over spectacularly. During this time, the media had campaigned vociferously and vigorously um, against, against these uh, proposals, and they died a sorry death, and, and not many people were all that sad about it, and not many people uh, wanted to revisit the issue. And so there's two things that come out of that. One is that the issue of how properly to hold the news media to account, um, as most people think should, it should be, if it holds others to account, the government, as Annika has talked about, the judiciary, the bureaucracy, uh, hospitals, uh, all of these, all of these other institutions in society, if the news media holds them to account, and it does and it should, why, why would not the news media itself be held to account? And if our mechanisms for doing that are flawed, that's a significant problem, precisely because the news media is so valuable and freedom of the press is so important in our society. So work done either terribly, if you believe one set of views, or left, left unfinished is another way to perceive, uh, perceive it on that issue. And as, again, as John alluded to, you're doing all my stuff for me, John. Um, Mark Zuckerberg and regulation, finally, 10 years later, people are saying, actually, maybe some regulation is needed of online media because as Emily Bell, um, of, of formerly of The Guardian, has said and written very eloquently, Facebook has eaten the world, uh, both in a, in a user sense, almost everybody's on Facebook, and in a money sense, as in they have cannibalised the media uh, business model which supported media for so many years and supported it quite handsomely and well, but no longer. Uh, so, one media campaign, by the media about itself was very, very successful uh, back in 2011, 12, 13. The question I ask is how successful do you think this campaign has been so far? I mean, I guess you're probably getting a sense that I think the answer to that question is not very successful at all so far. There is some discussion going on at federal government level about the need to reform the laws of defamation, which Richard may pick up, and which absolutely is needed. But what has struck me is the contrast between one very successful campaign run by the media about 10 years ago, and so far one that is kind of bouncing off the Prime Minister a bit like, you know, all of our thoughts and, and, and concerns and so on about the bushfires recently. So I don't know what's going on there. I'm happy to um, talk about a few ideas I have about why that is, but I think at this stage I'll, I'll leave those opening remarks there and we can pick them up if you wish in further discussion and questions. Thank you. Oh. Well, thanks everybody. And um, I'm very pleased to be here. And I hope you can hear me because I can't hear a thing sitting there. It's just sort of... This wonderful gilded room that looks as though Donald Trump has been designing it. Um, just the acoustics are weird. But um, look, I've always thought this expression, um, freedom of the press, freedom of the media, was a very self-indulgent notion. I mean, I would prefer something like, you know, be nice to journalists or answer their phone calls or, you know, give them some information. But freedom of the press implies that there should be special freedoms that maybe other people don't have. And when you consider the idea of a newspaper, um, this, this product that comes out every day, and I've forgotten who described it in these terms, but it is this imperfect assembly of news and information and commentary and photos and advertising, all decided by editors who are making imperfect choices. What to leave out is just as important as what to put in. Um, then it's all got to fit, and the fitting of it is determined by the volume of advertising that's paying for the, for the wretched thing. Um, and this is then put on dead trees, on presses, and put on trucks and delivered 
around the place and then you go home and you wake up and you come in next day and you do it all again. And there's always that expectation that the next day it'll be a more perfect product, it'll be a better newspaper. But it, it never is perfect. It's a, it's a percentage game journalism. It's a percentage of what you can capture in that moment and, and deliver. Um, there used to be, you know, the old rather, rather cynical saying, you know, a free press for those who own one. Um, that meant people that had $600 million that could afford to buy a printing press and another $200 million to set up uh, um, an organisation to, to print papers. Well, now, the barriers to entry have virtually disappeared. Everyone can be a publisher on their phones. And this has altered the entire equation about what the media is and where, what the definition is and who we are and are we really journalists and there are all these citizen journalists springing out with their opinions and, and conspiracy theories and nutty notions and it's all swamping us. So what this discussion is about, I think, is about a media that is well curated, well researched and professional. And that is, that is what, as John says, a democracy needs because we take it for granted that there are, you know, the main democratic institutions are elected politicians, um, the executive government of the nation, the independent courts, uh, but the media does have a vital role in holding, you know, the political process, the corporate process, the artistic community, every endeavour of life to account. I mean, you just got to think for 40 seconds what the Morrison government would be like if there were no newspapers. They would just, you know, there'd just be a riot. They would just, they would just <laughs> roll right over the top of this country. At least the newspapers are, and, the, and, and um, other media too, are uh, doing something of a job to hold government, politicians, corporates to account. Now the problem is that capacity to do that job is shrinking all the time. Um, you can see it with national security laws, you know, where, where Annika is rubbed up um, a fairly close personal experience with, with them, uh, with defamation, with sources. I mean, the whole lifeblood of information depends on sources. And we saw today the federal court, which, you know, part of me thinks is an abomination. They've struck down the ABC's challenge to the warrant that, um, you know, they raided the ABC back in June, the federal police raided the ABC back in June, it may have been July, but I think it was June, um, took away hundreds of documents in relation to stories about the role of the Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan. This was a story that no one has ever said was incorrect or was wrong or had been um, over-gilded. It was also a story where the source for, for some of that information was already publicly known. So you just wonder what the police are doing trampling into the national broadcaster, seizing documents. It was nothing more than an, an attempted intimidation at not only the journalists, but the sources of journalists. And now, um, last year, there were some amendments to the secrecy provisions in Australia, which until then had been fairly um, relaxed, but it's criminalised government whistle, whistleblowers and criminalised journalists for reporting what government whistleblowers um, provide to them. So this has led to a very chilling effect, um, an uncertainty really, you know, someone comes in with a hot story from, about um, some malfeasance in the government, the lawyers in the newspaper or the, uh, or the television station look at it and say, oh, we don't know, this could be in breach of the National Security Act or this could be in breach of the ASIO Act. We don't know if this is a special ASIO operation which we can't report at all. 
Um, we can't report certain court proceedings at all. So the result of that sort of uncertainty is a chilling effect. The decision inevitably is don't publish it. It's better to put another mushroom omelette recipe in the paper than actually report something that's in the public interest. Anyway, that'll do for the moment. Thank you. <laughs> Owing to the brevity of our three speakers, we have extra time for them now to answer my questions. So if they thought they were getting out of it lightly, they're wrong. But we're going to approach things in different ways. I have about 372 questions, and I'm not going to ask them all. So questions. Annika, if I can cross-examine you first, if you could swear on your the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'll say whatever my lawyers let me say, but yes, I'm happy to answer your questions, John. And I do understand and respect the fact that there undoubtedly are things that you're withholding for the purpose of defending yourself in case proceedings are issued against you. And I again say I have no idea how you carry that stress and burden and congratulations to you. What was the reaction from your editor and publishers when they found out that your story was getting them too, as well as you, into such hot water? They were, you know, as supportive as they can be. And I think the thing that's lost in all of this is that when I did go and initially pitch this story, we don't just sort of write stories and send them in and these are things that are discussed at weeks and months ahead sometimes. Um, and we knew there was an inherent risk in publishing this story. Uh, you get legal advice, as you know, as a lawyer. <laughs> You get a lot of different legal advice, a lot of conflicting legal advice. Um, on the day we decided to publish what appeared to be the top of a government document, whether we were, whether it was or what, not, is still up for debate. But it, that was sort of the decisions you make in the course of the moment that can, you know, have huge effects in this. And um, the case that they didn't raid my workplace. It's been well reported that on day three, after raiding my house and then the ABC, they were, did have a warrant to go to my workplace and there's been a lot of con sort of conspiracy theories about why that didn't happen. I can tell you it was a cock up over a conspiracy. They knew their warrant was probably not gonna, was gonna be challenged and probably wasn't up to scratch. And my workplace is of course Parliament House and to come into Parliament House they would have had to get approval from the Speaker and the President and that put the government in a pretty dodgy situation. It has happened before um, with the NBN raids but they try not to do that so that's why they came to my home. Um, now I might be the one that would, you know, is talked about going to jail but as you say my editors would be on the hook for this too. Uh, and they make those decisions every day. There are currently at News Corp 10 journalists that it hasn't been ruled out that they would uh, go to jail for different things. I'm probably the most public one because there was a raid at my home, but there are other proceedings bubbling along and a lot of editors on the hook for this, and they, that's a decision they live with every day as editors of newspapers. Uh, there are proceedings that have mostly been dropped, but I'm not sure if any of your colleagues are still under fire over breaching the suppression orders on George Pell's trial. Yeah, they dropped a bunch of them last week. They dropped a bunch, but there's, they, they dropped 105, but Richard probably knows. I think there's still about 100 still on foot, including against foreign entities, which raises the fascinating question whether or not Peter Kidd, the Chief Judge of the County Court of Victoria, can enforce contempt proceedings against Facebook or the New York Times. And how does he imprison the editor of the New York Times if he's so minded? Richard. Yeah, some of, some of the... Uh, <clears throat> some charges were dropped earlier um, last week, some extra ones. So I'm not sure now how many editors and um, proprietors and, and publishing companies are actually defendants in that case, but it's the, the criticism I saw from the judge in the last round was that he was very upset that, you know, the DPP hadn't got its act together and actually provided the defendants with you know, some thorough information yep. about what the charge is and what right. the details are. That was Johnny Dixon um, in the Supreme Court in Victoria. Dixon, yes. And, yes, and the Peter Kidd, who is the Chief Judge of the County Court, who, um, I'm not sure this has ever been published. Have you seen the transcript? 
when he called Kerry Judd, the DPP, and Robert Richter before him to discuss what he said were the most blatant breaches of suppression orders any of them had ever seen. And he basically says, if I had a guillotine in the courtyard behind the court, I'd use it this afternoon, and not for the purpose of cutting up paper either, I should say. Uh, he was furious, and he made his fury absolutely clear if you read the transcript of those proceedings. It's hilarious. You yes. rarely hear a judge being so no, angry. I, it was. I did, I did read the, the transcript, and I think it was going around on the internet a bit. But the In fact, he says, um, I know I shouldn't be on the bench when I'm this angry, but I'm staying here for this hearing. I mean, it just sort of shows this sort of weird netherworld where none of the allegedly offending uh, media organisations mentioned the word Pell. Yep. And um, so it's this sort of guessing game. Did people guess that this headline that says big big uh, trial decision has been handed down that we can't tell you, did people automatically switch their brain onto the word Pell? Um, this is a whole lot of guesswork that you think, you know, a criminal court's not going to sort of contend with very comfortably. So I, it, it, the other thing, of course, is that the this suppression order had a sort of mythical quality about it because it was it was put in place because there was meant to be a second trial for Pell. That second trial was called off, so therefore there was no absolute need for a, for a suppression order on the result of the first trial. Um, it does strike me as a bit of overreach by the DPP to keep chasing this and spending a lot of resources and time when they could be doing some proper criminal work. Annika, uh, has, I'll, I'll come to you, Matthew, you haven't been forgotten, I promise you. Has anyone pointed out to the Federal Police that they raided the ABC Sydney headquarters even though both the journalists they were investigating work out of Melbourne? Uh, I don't know, I did speak to Sam Clark, one of them yesterday, and we, we have joked about this before. The alarming thing was too, they had to get permit, they had to get swipe in cards, so they had to tell them they were coming, whereas to get into my house they didn't need a swipe card. So um, there were, the one at the ABC was a little bit more organised, but I guess it's the power once they get in and onto that computer system, how much they can take. And uh, they haven't come to News Corp yet for, to raid myself or my colleagues in a work sense, but that warrant still exists and they have stopped the investigation while we're challenging my warrant and that could sort of see what they do. But once they get into those computer systems, it's not just, and I sort of say this was what they've taken off my phone, it's not just that one story. Um, I have on my phone the phone numbers of a lot of politicians and a lot of staffers and sources who text me about a range of things and personal communications. And that open, the amount of information those police were able to see when they went into the ABC is terrifying. And if it's indeed the same encryption experts that worked on RoboDebt, for instance, they'll never work any of it out. So <laughs> it'll all amount to naught, perhaps. Um, and the curious thing also is that the source of that story has outed himself, publicly dared them, and indeed now has been prosecuted. There is no mystery, none whatsoever, about the source of the information. And these raids are almost operatic in scale, and it's hard to escape making, leaping to the conclusion that they're entirely designed to be theatrical and a, and a, a de public demonstration of power, rather than trying to solve a crime, because the crime has been solved. Well, they don't, um, they quite like um, raiding journalists, but the AFP has a um, distinct um, dislike of investigating people like Angus Taylor uh, for fraudulently manipulating documents uh, from his office with his signature on them that he sent to the uh, Daily Telegraph. So uh, you just wonder what the sort of priorities are. You just, well, we don't wonder I mean, it wasn't even, they decided not even to investigate the complaint about Taylor. It wasn't that they investigated and found it wasn't there wasn't an offence. They didn't want to investigate it. They didn't investigate it because he apologised. Yep. Uh, Matthew, can you take us through, do you think the Right to Know campaign, if you could explain what it is and then tell us whether you think it's going to achieve anything? Okay, well, the Right to Know campaign has actually been around for about, well, more than a decade, since around 2007, 2008. Uh, but it it's a coalition of the, all of the mainstream media companies, uh, News Corp, um, the ABC, 
Fairfax Media before it became part of Nine, Nine as well, uh, who else, um, Macquarie Media and so on. So most of the major media players are in it and they, they are quite rightly concerned about a number of things. One of them, or a couple of them, have already been alluded to, such as the uh, problems with the laws of defamation, which, um, I mean, Richard's much more eloquent and knowledgeable on this than I am, but, it, but many cases are being lost, that is, by media companies on what look like fairly spurious technical legal grounds. Uh, the number of suppression orders that are that are made by judges around the country, in particular in Victoria, here, something like 1,590 or something at the moment, uh, in a report I read just recently. Suppression orders? Suppression orders. How many of those are about Nicola Gobbo, I wonder? Well, yes. There used to be a, when I worked at The Age, there was a journalist whose job was to track all of the suppression orders and how they related, and, and she was an absolute font of knowledge on that, but needed to be. Um, suppression orders, defamation, uh, national security laws and the fact that we've had both a lot of them enacted in the past 20 years since, um, since the September 11 attacks and that they are increasingly onerous for the doing of journalism. They make it, it they almost, well, some would say they criminalise the act of doing journalism and uh, that's one of the things that obviously Annika's run into. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, there were six main arms to the Right to Nose campaign. What do I? Freedom of, in, freedom of information, which it's an old joke, but it has become freedom from information. It's an act that's been around now since 1982 or three federally, and 1982 in Victoria. And John Cain. John Cain, the late John Cain, uh, brought it in. And it's, there are so many exemptions in uh, that, those acts governments can and do drive trucks through them in order to not release documents that the objects of the act say, you know, you, all of us in this room, not only journalists, but every single person in this room and around the state and the country has the right to apply for access to documents. That's what a Freedom of Information Act is supposed to be. So I've probably left out one or two, but the, the point is that there were a, a range of issues that the media is in my view, quite rightly concerned about, and so they they gathered themselves together as a coalition to lobby government quite explicitly and deliberately, and in my view, so far, not particularly sex successfully, and I'm just not quite sure why that is, when they generally, um, you know, there's an old adage which I think is attributed to Mark Twain, which is, never pick a fight with someone who buys ink by the barrel. And as you can see from the 19th century reference, it's about newspapers and the fact that if you own newspapers, you have a great deal of ability to not only get your message across in any kind of public lobbying, but to get it across megaphone style. You know, you can, you can do that. That historically when the media campaigns, even in isolation, that is even one company or one newspaper, they can have a huge impact on government. All of the media is campaigning on this and maybe some movement on defamation law. I'd be really interested in what Richard's views on that are, but not so far on other things. And I, I mean, I, I think that my, my thinking about that is one of the reasons is that the media environment has changed. The news, the mainstream news media is nowhere near as powerful as it used to be. There's so many other voices out there, whether it's ordinary citizens, whether it's conspiracy theorists, etc., and there are now mechanisms, as you would have um, maybe be aware of, for amplifying cr what used to be the kind of things that your crazy Uncle Arthur said at, after too many reds at Christmas, and, and most people in the family would just ignore uh, him. Now, they're everywhere all over the internet, and they get spread, and they get shared, and they get amplified, and they tend to drown out a lot of the, the coverage that's going on from Annika's newspapers and other media outlets, the ABC and so on. You've been on the receiving end of a pile-on by the Murdoch media, sorry Annika, but um, when, the, when the Fink's report that you were so involved in, sorry, the Fink is his name when he was at the bar, and it was a very funny gag at the time because as you've noticed, Matthew's very tall. For those of you not aware, Ray Finkelstein is exceptionally short. 
and it was always said this report will be the long and the tall, or long and the short, or whatever gag people came up with of the topic. But um, when Fink's report came down, it was extraordinary, the pile on, and some of it directed personally at you. Um, do you think the media is united in its concern over these issues, or are we going to see the same fragmentation and the same tit for tat, the same tribalism that resulted from the report you co-authored? Uh, my sense is that they are united. They are. They are. I, I haven't seen anyone stepping out and saying all of those issues we've been talking about are, are not good issues to be campaigning on. So I haven't seen that. Um, they were united back then, and uh, uh, they, there was a pile on. Some of it was personal. It, it, I mean, I was someone who had worked as a journalist since the early 1980s and have always believed in both the value of journalism and the freedom of the press. And so I was a bit gobsmacked, I have to say, by the way in which um, I was quite up for a debate about the report. I, you know, there are things you could absolutely contest in there and have a good debate about, uh, but that that debate didn't happen. Um, and it's a trend that Laura Tingle outlined, uh, you know, the ABC's Laura Tingle outlined at a, a conference I was at late last year where she was talking about the Gonski reforms and everyone just shorthands Gonski, but it was a, um, a plan by the previous Labor government to change the way in which the allocation of money for schools was going to happen and to make it fairer for all. That was the kind of idea whether they got there or not is another matter, but Laura's point was that when, when the final Gonski report was about to be delivered, either immediately before it was delivered or immediately after, Christopher Pine, who was then the Shadow Minister for Education, um, piped up and said, you know, this is a terrible report, this, you know, we reject it entirely, and, and the media coverage went stampeding off in that direction, and never actually stopped and said, well, what is actually in the Gonski report? What is his argument? What's his evidence? What's his idea? Um, you had to read a lot and quite widely to even find that. And, and if you, I mean, the most recent example of this to me is the, um, the bill about religious discrimination, which it's very hard to find an actual account saying what is being proposed, how that might be moving, and then some just discussion about what do you think about this? Is this a good idea? Is it a bad idea? In, indeed, the contrast between the religious freedom campaign compared to free speech or media freedom campaign, which one occupies more of the so-called culture war? I mean, it's extraordinary. Richard, you write about this in your Saturday paper column from time to time. Religious, I mean, it's just a mess, the religious freedom bill. Um, <clears throat> chaotic, the, the churches want more, the civil liberty organisations um, see it as a, um, an avenue for um, vile remarks and discrimination to be made on the basis of religious or, or faith belief. And, um, you know, Porter's got himself, the Attorney General, into a terrible mess trying to reconcile these two things. It's, it's completely unreconcilable. There doesn't really need to be any more religious freedom. It's perfectly fine as it is. This is a Morrison thing to, you know, scratch his fleas off with his Pentecostal mates. And um, it's ridiculous. I'm, I'm glad everyone agrees. Um, <laughs> but um, on the issue of the you know, the, 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 the right to know that you were talking about. I think this is very interesting because, um, you know, it, it wasn't always this sort of unanimous voice within the media about right to know. I can well remember, you know, when, when the Fairfax papers, The Age or the, the Sydney Morning Herald or the Financial Review got into trouble in the courts or, or they were raided or there was a defamation action that they lost, Particularly the Australian would be gleeful, it would be attacking them, this is, you know, these silly mugs, you know, look what they've done, it's a mess and they've made mistakes. Um, I think the, the unanimity came about as a result of the raid on Annika and News Corp joined the fold and has been party to a more unified voice. So Annika is the glue in the right to know organisation. We should be very grateful yeah, to the do. Federal Police for achieving what no one else could in getting the different tribes of the media all on the same page in a way. 
But Annika, have sources dried up? Because you said before, your editors and publishers have backed you all the way and they've certainly expended a lot of energy and spent a lot of actual cash so far on very highly paid QCs whose kids are getting all their orthodontic bills paid for out of Rupert Murdoch's pocket. That's wonderful. But have sources dried up? Have people been deterred from passing on information to you? Initially, 100%. I continued to try and work for a little bit last year and was like, this isn't going to affect what I do. That's, you know, they'll win if I stop doing this. Uh, but I found it particularly hard. And I had a conversation with a former uh, News Corp journalist, Jared Henderson, who... Um, just escaped a jail conviction about 10 years ago uh, for an innocuous story about uh, changes to veterans affairs payments which nearly landed him in jail because he refused to uh, reveal, it was him and Michael Harvey, in re refused to re reveal a source and he's now a political staffer and has been a source of strength for me. But he said to me, I found that everybody was very pleasant to me and smiled and asked how I was but sources dried up. and. To start with, yes, I spoke to a number of ministers who said I don't want to talk on the phone and we've since found out, we knew my phone was being bugged but they released a report last year saying six journalists have had their phone bugged in the last year so you can probably guess who that is, me, a couple of my editors, Sam Clark, Dan from ABC. Um, so it was... Do you, think, do you think your phone is still bugged? 100%. And have you got a burner? Uh, it, they'll just chase it, so I don't... People know what a burner phone is? It's where you go and buy a printer. Old Nokia phone, phone or people something. People can't track, yeah. track it down. Um, we just think anything on the phone now is not yep. sort of, you know, so I don't have those high-level conversations. I moved house because we thought my house might be bugged um, and also that they can potentially record even then when it's sitting... Yeah, they can be eavesdropping on us right now through our phones. Are people aware of that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> so I, even if I have a serious conversation, I leave my phone at home and go for a walk in a park or to a fountain yeah. or something yeah. like that. You, where you, you, your phone can be turned off and it can still be used for someone to access your conversation remotely. Yeah. So you do occasionally, I've had this experience too, where someone says, leave your phone at home and we'll go for a walk, take the dog down the park without the phone so that we can have a conversation knowing that it's not being in any way... Infamously, Sam Dastiari warned someone about that and got caught out doing it um, because he may have known that a phone was being bugged. But yes, they can be that. So, look, it can't, a lot of that can't be used and if it came up in court, it would be an interesting sort of thing. Um, but it, it has, of course, dried up sources. I think six months down the track, um, the benefit I have is working in Parliament House, so I just go and knock on doors um, of offices. Our offices are in Parliament House, like the ministers and the MPs, so I can have a lot of face-to-face -face conversations, but it has taken a lot of effort for people to trust me again, just knowing that, you know, the AFP have access to everything that they send me. Now, the great irony, of course, is that sometimes the most damaging material about any government is often provided to journalists by people who are supposedly part of that government, just those who aren't actually in the position they feel that they ought be in within the government. So the idea that it's all, you know, the enemy, well, it comes down to how you define the enemy. It's very short-sighted because, of course, the other thing is that inevitably the people who are the government at the moment one day will be the opposition. Uh, uh, having said that, Labor, when my, uh, this leak came out, Mark Dreyfus, within 24 hours, wrote to Malcolm Turnbull and said, I think you should investigate this. So um, they're being very supportive now, but no government likes leaks because, as you say, when they become the government or the opposition, they, they don't want to deal with that either. But it, there is a big contrast. Um, the one that comes up with me is often the Medivac um, leak. There was a leak on the front of the Australian newspaper, which has been guessed that it perhaps came from Home Affairs, Peter Dutton's office, somebody within that realm. I don't know where it came from, but it hadn't been seen by many people outside of that scope, and it was uh, it was advantageous to the government, uh, and it sort of backed in their view on the Medivac legislation. Um, it, there was no raids about that, and uh, cabinet leaks are the things pol journalists, political journalists, want the most, and they happen rarely. Uh, but there does seem to be quite um, a different view about who gets investigated and who doesn't. And I was speaking to Laurie Oakes about, he got a lot of cabinet leaks in his time, but one of them he got was about Kevin Rudd's fuel watch system, which uh, a lot of people disagreed with, um, but Kevin Rudd went ahead with anyway, and he'd had advice that it wasn't perhaps going to achieve what he wanted to, to achieve. 
and the head of the AFP rang Laurie Oakes and said, now, do you still have the document that you, know, you revealed in the paper? And he said, no, I don't. And they said, because Laurie, if you do, we'd have to uh, you know, come over and search your house. And he just said, it doesn't exist anymore. And that's how it used to operate too. You know, you'd write something and the Old school. ring up and say, Annika, do you have that document? And I'd say, what document? And they would have been seen as doing their work. I would have been seen as cooperating in a certain level and we'd all move on. But the extent of time and effort and money going into my case is absurd. What do you think's changed, Annika, in that sense? If that's how it used to be done, what, what, what has changed and why, do you think? I'm not sure because speaking to people at the AFP, I think they're sick of being used as a political tool. I don't think anybody signed They say up. that to you off the record or in a conversation in the park with no one having a phone with them. <laughs> yeah. Look, at, even the people who came to my house, outside of maybe the two more senior police who were there, I think they felt very uncomfortable going through my property. I don't think they sign up to the AFP to search journos. They want to go after pedophiles or drug dealers or terrorists. And this isn't, they don't want to be involved in political games, but they have to be seen once they get a referral to do this. Uh, I don't think there is an appetite for it within the actual police. It's the people above them yep. that do it. Richard, um, we've got plenty of time. How do you define the public interest? Sorry. How do you define the public interest? The public was interest. Barnaby's baby yes. being declared? Was that in the public interest? Very loose term that um, means different things to different people. It doesn't mean much to judges. Um, they don't have a, um, a strong view of the, of the public interest. They resent... Um, I think there's a sort of cultural problem too with, with judges resenting journalism and, and, and publishers. Um, the hostility you see in the courts quite frequently between, you know, from judges about how dare you sort of publish this stuff. Um, they think maybe journalists are trampling on their patch or, or, or something, but it's, it's the, the whole idea of public interest in, in defamation has, is not existent. There are some public interest offences under the new um, <clears throat> state security laws that were passed last um, uh, 2018, the secrecy laws that criminalise the whistleblowers and the journalist reporting. Uh, there's a public interest, but it would be meaningless. I mean, once, once that gets into a court, you know, nothing's in the public interest. Um, state security is more important than the public interest. And, um, I mean, it's sort of incredible in a way when you think that as far as defamation goes, which is a huge problem for the media, the amount of money that's spent on defending um, journalism is, is quite staggering and the, the time and the resources that go into it. And yet in, in the United States, someone like, well, someone like Jeffrey Rush would not be able to bring a successful case. It would just be a you know, a First Amendment case, it'd be uh, straight out the door. Um, many, you know, there's a very good reason why Harvey Weinstein hasn't sued the New York Times or the New Yorker. He wouldn't have a leg to stand on. Um, here, though, there's been plenty of Me Too type cases. I mean, Russia's a Me Too type case, if you look at it like there was another one with that cricketer, Chris Gale. Um, that was a Me Too type case. Um, Craig McLaughlin. And they're all successful. Craig McLaughlin, the... Uh actor who was in the Rocky Horror Picture Show is another one. Well, that's, that's actually a criminal prosecution of him, though. It's not a defamation action. Sorry, yes. He's being... Who was that? Craig McLaughlin. Oh, well, he's got, he's got... He's suing as well in defamation, but he's got... But it'll have to await the result first. of the yeah, trial. Yeah. 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 That's still going on or adjourned or... Yeah, eternally. Mm. So, um, trying to define the public interest, you're telling us, is somewhat elastic and uh, an exercise in futility. So those people who are entrusted with trying to do their work in the public interest are a bit in the dark. Matthew, do you think a Bill of Rights would make any difference if it included things like media freedom along with other human rights for Australia? Um, I'm not sure about a Bill of Rights, but I do think that some kind, of, something, some act which actually enshrines freedom of the press, or the media really, more broadly than the press, is needed. We don't actually have that at present at all. We have, um, through a High Court decision that occurred um, nearly 30 years ago, um, what's called an implied right of freedom of political communication, 
and as you can hear from the language, that's very sort of hedged. Uh, so we have a whole lot of acts that have been brought in, as I said, in the last 20 years about national security. National security is clearly an important issue. Um, we are living in a different world now to what we were living in the 1990s or 80s, but we still don't have any kind of legislated uh, freedom of the press and acknowledgement that it's of its role. It's implied, it's uh, in that one High Court case back from about 1992. That's what I, that's what I think needs. And that, that was one of the actual legitimate arms or, or elements of the debate against the report that Ray Finkelstein and I handed down, which was, well, you want to improve the regulation, but don't we also need to improve uh, freedom of the press first? If you, if you beef up regulation, don't you need to beef up freedom of the press as well? Which, is, which was a good, a good point, a good debate to have had, we could have had then. Annika, you started out working here in Bendigo on a regional newspaper. We've very much focused on the national scene and big picture issues. What's the effect of this suppression of free speech though at the local and regional level? Because the same principles apply but regional media have nothing like the checkbooks available to them that your employers have. Yeah, I think it's even harder. And um, News Corp may have deep pockets, but it's the amount of money that, as you would know, as a lawyer, is uh, we're spending on this is incredible. And about how much are you allowed to tell us? Uh, I once saw something that came across my desk. I had to sign about the hourly rate <laughs> for the lawyers that we have. I look, we don't know where it's up to, but I think we were sort of, you know thinking it would be somewhere around half a million dollars. The government probably have spent more, uh, and whoever loses will have to pay damages for the other side, so. And costs, and you're worth every cent, I might say, too. So it is, it is incredible, the amount of, and you know, this is taxpayer money on the AFP side. Uh, if they lose, it'll be interesting to see, sort of, you know, if they keep going with this investigation, because it becomes a very hard political argument to sell, to say we're spending millions of dollars chasing me, not terrorists, but if they want to do that, that's fine. We buy ink by the barrels, so good luck to them. Um, but I think, yeah, your point about regionally, it's journalism regionally is hard for so many reasons, and that's just one of them, but the resources, um, trying to be a journalist in a small town when uh, Melbourne and Canberra and Sydney are big places and you can burn a contact and annoy somebody and move on and it doesn't have detrimental effects, but, you know, if you do, do someone over in a town like this, it can mean you don't have, you know, a lot of uh, other options. So there is enough stresses, let alone the huge financial cost, given nobody's buying newspapers anymore and people want news to be free, uh, let alone the legal, you know, issues and the right to know campaign. It, it isn't just going to help if we achieve anything. Uh, metropolitan papers, it'll, you know, have a flow-on effect to help out local journos too, which it should. We will be shortly getting to the audience participation part of it all. And if you're in the front row, yeah, they've all got buckets of water and water pistols to squirt at you. No. So we will get to that shortly and I'll be looking for people offering me bids from wherever. And I think we should send a special cheerio because when Annika's comments are all transcribed for the federal police, I think we should send them a big cheerio and they can put a highlighter pen through it and say what a cheeky bunch they were in Bendigo there because undoubtedly that'll come through, there's no doubt about it. Um, the flip side to this, of course, is whether or not the model of media that served us however reasonably over the last however many hundred years, whether it serves our purposes as a democracy into the future, which raises the incredibly vexed question, and to start for each of you, but to start, Matthew, with you, where does the money come from for investigative journalism when the model, the business model, of the, in particular, big empires that we're used to, when that seems to be collapsing in front of our eyes. Well, that is a, that is a real problem, and it's a really urgent issue, which I would love for there to be more public discussion and attention paid to it, because, uh, as I said earlier, uh, quoting Emily Bell, Facebook has eaten the world, and I, financially, Facebook and Google, their market capitalization absolutely dwarfs even that of Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, like 10, 15 times bigger. Okay, they are huge, huge global companies. Um, they employ many, many lobbyists to argue for them in various parliaments around the world. And 
the dance that is going on about them and regulation that John alluded to earlier is, is just that at the moment, as far as I can see, a dance. So they do put some money into news and so on, and you know the views about that are mixed. Uh, the Google News Initiative and so on. Some people think that's great that they're starting to actually take it seriously. Some people think it's kind of like lolly water. They're just sort of trying to placate uh, people in the industry and indeed in academia by getting you know uh, people like myself to do, as in academics and journalism, to do research. Um, what I mean, the other arm of it about which I'm very concerned is the public broadcasters in this country, the ABC and SBS. There's there's quite a shift going on in the in not so much in the public debate, but at the political level, the culture wars level. It's not simply a kind of oh, there goes those lefties at the ABC again sort of debate. It's we want to stop the ABC, we want to privatise it, or we want to kill it altogether. And I, as far as I can see, there's never been a greater time for the ABC. I mean, now... Um, <laughs> in less than an hour, in less than an hour, uh, there will be a Four Corners program on tonight, which you may have heard about in the news today, to do with uh, concerns about St Kevin's in um, Melbourne, very prestigious Catholic school, covering up and uh, not dealing properly with one of their teachers who was alleged and then uh, convicted of, of um, uh, sexual grooming abuse. sexual abuse of one of the students there. So those programs take about six weeks to pull together. How many other commercial media outlets, particularly in broadcast, have the time or resources to devote to that kind of investigation? And yet that's enormously important work that gets done and so that's, that's my question there, so. Yeah. And, and without telling too many secrets, the lawyers for St Kevin's have done their absolute best to stop that program going to air, to stop any staff speaking, any former staff speaking, former students speaking, and to try and identify who within the school community are the whistleblowers so that they can be undoubtedly dealt with. Investigative journalism, Annika? Um, look, just in my time at the Herald Sun, I've been there about 10 years, and the number of the drop-in staff is alarming. Um, you know, News Corp is a very big media empire. I'm not saying we're not, but it's, it's dropped off incredibly because there's just the, the money stream, people buying newspapers and advertisers advertising in our papers isn't just it's not what it used to be. Uh, we have, against the odds, just started up an investigations unit, which we haven't had for about 10 years, so that's a good thing. But it takes time, and the problem is it's cyclical. So if we have fewer journalists, we uh, rush stories, we don't do them as well, we you know, miss the big story when, to get the quick hit, uh, therefore our quality drops, therefore people stop buying the newspaper, therefore we have no money. So it, it's really hard to convince editors and those at the top of a company to invest in real investigative journalism. Um, I'm glad we are doing it, but I really, I don't know what the answer is to, to do it long term. And, and half of the challenge is so-called, and you know, some of them play an important role, but citizen journalists that, you know, very often very critical of us for why don't you report this and why don't you do this, but real journalism takes a lot of time and a lot of money and there's a lot of dead ends and you can work on stories for ages and then, you know, they don't come off and it's frustrating and trying to convince people to fund that. Uh, whether the public or proprietors is, is just a huge challenge. I'll come to you in a second, Richard. Let's point out, though, that the entire Hain Royal Commission investigation that stripped away the artifice about how our banks were supposedly looking after us, in fact, they weren't, they were shafting us, would never have happened without whistleblowers and investigative journalism. Nicola Gobbo, the Herald Sun invested countless hours of two top journalists' time and buckets of money taking all the way to the High Court an attempt by Vic Pohl to stop the Gobbo story ever being known by the public. And it is hilarious, and you can put a highlighter pen this, through this to Federal Police when you're monitoring this. It is hilarious that the head lawyer for Vic Pohl has given sworn testimony at this Royal Commission that he was appalled by Gobbo giving evidence against her clients when that is the same lawyer who has fought tooth and nail to stop anything ever being known by the public 
and has devoted his considerable resources and enormous amounts of public money. What's his name? That same man, Finn McRae. Finlay McRae. He won a prize. I had to present it to him at the Law Week Awards for Best Public Service Lawyer. And I was MC. I wasn't a dignitary. I was the MC that night. He's obviously a fine servant of Victoria Police, but it was his work that took the Gobbo's suppression all the way to the High Court as they tried to defend the indefensible and then give sworn evidence that he was personally appalled by it all, but there you go. Richard, investigative journalism, is there a future? There's got to be a future because that is one of the important lifeblood elements of the modern media, the contemporary media, to explore, to expose, to ventilate and to hold to account. That is. That's an important thing, but it's not to say that um, other sort of journalism is less important. I mean, what we've seen with this constant attrition of staff and resources and the wearing down of newsrooms is, you know, things like reporting of local councils and um, what, what civic society is doing, what, what the police rounds, what the police are doing, what other civic organisations are up to, the reporting of that has, has diminished. And this also has been a lifeblood of contemporary you know, news reporting, and it's going. I've got a young fellow that helps me at, at my work, and he also does, he's a university student, still at university, so he does some um, part-time interning at the Sydney Morning Herald. So he goes in, they give him a shift on a, on a Sunday, and a couple of Sundays ago there were some big floods in Sydney, there was, you know, Narrabeen Lakes overflowed and, and people were having to be moved out and so on. So he, um, he said, there's no one else in the newsroom, there's, there's nothing, it's just him, young guy, not, not really a jur you know, proper journalist at all, but he's sitting there, he's getting his stories on a Twitter feed so he's looking for someone up at Narrabeen that can, you know, make a comment. So he's looking through Twitter to find someone at Narrabeen so he can get a comment from, this is the way journalism works, for God's sake. And um, um, <coughs> then the, the night editor said, well, maybe you should uh, go up to Narrabeen and take a photo of this flooded lake and that'd be nice to have in the paper. And the, he said, no, I can't, I can't leave my can't leave my desk here because I'm monitoring the whole news for the paper, the news stories for the paper on Monday. I mean, this is what's happened to, to daily journalism. I mean, I'm not saying he's, you know, I mean, he's a wonderful person and very capable of doing it, but, you know, I mean, where are the resources? And it, it's, it's, this is the tragic well, thing. Can you answer your own question? Where, where is it? What is it going to look like? Take us ahead five, ten years. What's it going to look like? Yeah, I mean, it's... I mean, you, you write for a paper, let's just make it clear here, you write for the Saturday paper, it's personally funded by someone who makes money out of property developing and then has a hobby of publishing news. Mm. So you get, you know, the monthly and quarterly essay and Saturday paper from Maury Schwartz making money out of putting up buildings in Brunswick. Well, I think a lot of things are cross-subsidised. I mean, I, I'm not... I, you know, every time I ask about how things work at the Saturday paper, I'm sort of shrouded in a sort of flow of mist, but... Um, oh, you just have to, you just have to go <laughs> to Ligon Street and hang out for long enough with Murray at... But I, I mean, you know, the Australian was cross-subsidised for many years. Yeah. I don't know if it's still the case, but... Um, just go to Jimmy Watson's on Friday evening and you'll have it all explained to you. <laughs> so, I, I think, you know, the, the, the you know, the platforms have obviously cannibalised um, a lot of the, the revenue from, from traditional journalism. And I was just telling Matthew earlier about this conference. In, there was a media conference in Austin, Texas. It was sort of illustrative of what's, what's going on. So all the sort of big, heavy, you know, analysts and media writers are there, and the conference is downstairs in a, in a big conference room. And all the, in the morning, delegates coming out of their rooms stepping over the local newspaper that's placed outside their door and looking at their phones to, to get the news as they go down to breakfast. I mean, this is, this is what's happened. So yep. no wonder there's no revenue. Sure. People aren't reading them. All right, let's do some market research. 
if there's people in the room, this is before we get to your questions, people in the room, how many of you, and put your hand up very high so we can see, how many of you paid money of your own, out of your own pocket, to buy a printed newspaper today? You are an exceptional bunch. Even if you're one of those people, if you, at some stage, on your phone or your laptop or your tablet, you checked the news today, online, put your hand up. It's almost everyone in the room, before it was about half who actually paid their own money to buy a printed newspaper. If we did that in the city, you would have about a quarter of people buying a newspaper. You would have about another quarter who looked at it very briefly while they waited for their soy decaf single origin latte in a keep cup while they were on their way very busy to their office. And the other half only looked at it online. My favourite ever media story, and it's very pertinent to this, is one that I think Richard Ackland told me years ago. And he's now so old he's probably even forgotten it himself. When Rupert Murdoch was but a lad with one newspaper he'd inherited from his father in Adelaide, he was supervising the evening press rolling out and he'd called the company's lawyer to check a terribly sensitive story that was on the front page. And as the papers came off the press, the lawyer picked it up and went, "Geez, Rupert, you can't print that. And Rupert slapped him down and said, and this is the greatest lesson you can learn, you're my lawyer, it's not your job to tell me what I can or can't print, it's your job to tell me how much it might cost me if I do. Well, um, there was a great story years ago when the Herald served an injunction from the High Court, the Sydney Morning Herald, to stop the presses, to stop the paper, because there was some defence documents that you know, the Department of Defence didn't want published. And a, a process server, or it's probably a sheriff or some person like that from the High Court, came into the Herald building. The paper was already on the presses. And um, he said, well, how, how do I stop the presses? You know, what, what, what do I do? He said, oh, well, you'll have to go down to the presses and uh, the uh, night editor will be there. He'll be looking at the papers coming off the presses. So you can talk to him about what what do you do to stop the presses? So Peter Bowers, there's a fellow called Daffy Bowers, who's long gone, but a fabulous bloke. He was the night editor of the Herald. This bloke from the High Court comes down. So I've got a, um, you know, an injunction here from the... We woke a judge up in his pyjamas. We've got an injunction to stop this bloody paper going on the press. He said, well, you know, I can't hear you. The presses are roaring. You know, um, <laughs> What are you saying? He said, I've got an injunction to stop the press. Well, where are you from? I said, oh, he said, I'm from the High Court. Well, how do I know you're from the High Court? You know, you're... so come upstairs, you know, come in. The paper's still <laughs> madly coming off the press. <laughs> come up, well, we'll, we'll ring the High Court and find it. no one at the High Court, of course. <laughs> Who gave you this bit of paper? So by, by the time all of this had happened, the paper was out and on the trucks. <laughs> That's the way to deal with an injunction. <laughs> All right, now very briefly, in maybe one minute or so, each of you, starting with you, Matthew, and then working up to Richard, are you optimistic or pessimistic? You have to stay optimistic. Um, David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, says uh, there is to, to be despairing about the state of the news media or of politics in his country, indeed in ours, is to be self-indulgent. And so, in my view, you, you must be optimistic. Absolutely. When I went through university, the first thing on my first day there, they said, basically, I don't know why you're all here, there won't be newspapers. Um, my textbooks predicted the demise of newspapers before 2020, and they're still going. I think it'll look different. And within the press gallery in Canberra, we had the Huffington Post for a while, they're not there, The Guardian, they don't put out a newspaper, they're all online. There's smaller voices, there's podcasts. I think news will look different, but the need for news will always be there. Richard? I think the the, um, the thing is that what's happening is this sort of atomization of, of the media. Um, the old big mastheads that we used to rely on every day are getting weaker and poorer and less well-staffed and less well-resourced. And what's happening is the, the flowering of 
on a myriad of online sources of news and information, which is much harder to aggregate and to, to, to have an effect. So if something really appalling happens that needs to be reported, um, there's less impact. And I think that, that is a problem. So I'm reasonably pessimistic. I think the, the, the situation is very dire and um, for, our, for our well-being and our enlightenment and so on, I think it's unlikely to change under this government or I would say under a Labor government who in many ways are just as appalling. Well, that brings us to an end of the addresses from our three expert speakers and you'll be asked to thank them in a moment so I won't preempt that and I'll hand over in a moment to the director of the, the chair of the board of ARC Justice. Um, closing remarks from me. There's a word that hasn't been used much here tonight but fundamentally it's at the core of this discussion and it's power. The brutal and sometimes raw exercise and use of power. And in a democracy, it has evolved in Western democracies through constitutions that everyone accepts that power has limits. And when those limits fray, you get these tectonic plates colliding. And that's where we're at now. And the pendulum swings, thank you Donald Trump, and the backlash, well, we'll find out later this year whether the backlash is catching up or the wave is too slow. But I'm optimistic it'll be there eventually because 300 people have turned up in Bendigo on a Monday night to discuss this. And you're not all octogenarians. <laughs> and the pendulum will swing because people care. And you can see in a totalitarian single party state like China with coronavirus, what happens if you don't value free speech, freedom of expression and an independent media? The people there for two weeks now have been lied to, the world's been lied to and they lie about their GDP and their shadow banking loans and all the rest of it. And they lie about fake building products and certification and so on and they've lied about a highly contagious and infectious disease. And that's what happens when you don't have an independent media and the whole world's sitting there going, holy schmoly, is that what goes on? So I'm looking forward to a university somewhere in Australia being gifted by a generous philanthropist enough of an endowment to create the Peter Bajelke Dutton Civil Liberties and Human Rights <laughs> Chair in investigative journalism and then everything will be all right again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you everybody. It's actually the library that gets to do the closing and the thanking. Um, we've been a bit of a sleeping partner so far. Um, I'd like to really thank John, Richard, Annika and Matthew for their timely and hugely entertaining and, and deeply thought out insights. And to reassure you, another reason for optimism is the amount of people that fight over the newspapers on a Saturday morning in Bendigo um, Library. So, <laughs> so people still do love their press. Um, Arc Justice and Goldfields Libraries would like to thank the following sponsors for their generous contributions to tonight's event and ongoing support of Talking Justice. Arnold Dallas McPherson Lawyers, Haven Homesafe, the Strategium Foundation, Robertson Hyatt Solicitors, Catholic Care Sandhurst and the Reichstein Foundation. I'd also like to thank Library Council and Arc Justice staff for the work they put on behind the scenes to um, deal with this ever-expanding event. Um, we at the library consider Talking Justice to be one of our most successful partnerships. Um, all of the succession sessions that we've had so far, we've had a hugely um, knowledgeable and expert and amazing panel of, of people and I feel like all we have to do is kind of sit back and let you walk us through um, some of the wickedest problems of the day. Um, the fact that these events are so well attended and that we book out so quickly um, reflects just how much this community, but I'm sure lots of other communities, want to, want to grapple with this stuff. It's hard stuff. Um, 
this particular session's been close to our library hearts um, because I feel we have a stake in this. Libraries curate information, we curate um, knowledge, and we also, in public libraries, have a, a really important role in bringing it to people who can't afford to pay, the, pay through the paywall. Um, when I started my career, information was a big buzzword. We were all trying to be information centres. Um, but I kind of think in the 30 years since the internet and the 10 years since social media, that's all been kind of debased. I think that the information superhighway is now a bit of a rubbish dump. And I think we need to start thinking about celebrating deeper knowledge, learning, um, expertise, in a way that um, we've, we're making it difficult for ourselves to do. Um, we've traditionally taken a really hands-off approach to curating information for people. Um, we prefer to allow punters to make their own minds up on controversial issues. And in the current climate um, of fake news and opinion, um, and the grey area between opinion and evidence base, fact, um, I, I wonder whether we're fooling ourselves that this is neutral, that this is a neutral stance. Um, just as museums and archives are grappling with the idea that their neutral collections are embedded in colonialism and oppression and dispossession, I wonder if we need to come to terms with the fact that our library collections, which are supposedly neutral, may in fact be helping to spread misinformation. Um, and some of that can be quite toxic, and whether we need to take a really, really big stance on that, as hard as it might be. Um, I'd really like to thank once again all of you for your passionate defence of our right to know, and help, hope that we can all work together in our own ways to help support our communities to make good, informed decisions about the really, really big complex issues that are facing us. Thank you.